This winter learning programme is brought to you by Homes England's Local Government Capacity Centre, which launched in the summer of last year. This slide summarises who we are and what we do. We've launched the centre following extensive research and consultations with you across local government and with a whole range of other partners to determine where authorities need most support and how this can best be delivered. I'm delighted to open this session for Homes England's Local Government Capacity Centre by showing you this welcome message from our Chief Executive, Peter Denton. As you can see, Peter is committed to ensuring Homes England supports your work and shares expertise, experience and skills to help get more homes built. Next slide, please. On the screen in front of you, you'll see a breakdown of the session today. We'll start with an introduction from Francesco Molino, followed by our latest insights with Andrew McWilliam and an interactive poll for you all to engage with, as well as a forward look from Imran Hashmi. We'll be finishing the session with a Q&A and I'll then be drawing the session to a close with a further poll to get some immediate feedback on the session today. Next slide, please. So without further ado, I will pass you over to Francesco. Thanks, Rory, and welcome, everyone. Hopefully, uh, the people that are having a problem with sound can hear now. And if not, I'm sure my colleagues uh, are on to this. Uh, welcome, everyone, and thanks for taking the time to be with us. If you can go to the next slide, I'll briefly introduce the research team that will be giving this session today. Um, so the research, uh, the Home England Research Analysis team was established to inform decision making. We give a strategic view um, of the housing market and the economy uh, to our board and to our member. We're a strategic resource for the organization. Uh, and our ambition in the long run, run uh, is to actually uh, have wider influence uh, in the housing sector and, and beyond, um, just to put analysis at the forefront. Uh, you can see at the front of the illustration at the bottom that the breadth uh, of the activities we do is quite uh, wide. So we start from having a very strategic macro uh, level uh, look at things, uh, which is what you could, could call research, uh, going all the way to doing uh, monitoring and evaluation of individual programs that Home England will do. So there is a lot to gra of ground to cover, and this is why there's three of us today. Uh, and I'm very glad to see from the poll that you've been asked at the beginning that no one is an expert in this topic because it takes three of us to cover it. Uh, so clearly none of us is an expert on it as well. And if we can go to the next slide, then we can get to the meaty bit of the conversation of the presentation. Uh, so this is how, in short, we feel uh, about uh, the state of the economy and the market. So uh, I would like everyone for the next 90 minutes to think about uh, the state of the market in terms of imbalances between demand and supply. And I'm sorry if this feels like an economics 101 session, but really uh, a lot of the problems drill down to, to these two issues. The fact that demand and supply are not matched and they're causing challenges for everyone. Uh, this is the reason also why, uh, because our economic output is mixed. So. Uh, while there are positive news about the speed at which the economy has recovered, we can see the cloud of the sharp rise of the cost of living and of inflation, uh, but we, we can also see the underlying fragility of the economy to the emergence of new COVID variants. Uh, as you could see in December, uh, it didn't take very much uh, for a, a variant to appear and uh, for it to stop uh, the best season for the hospitality sector, for example. And if this can happen again, uh, we are worried that uh, this can disrupt the economic recovery. Uh, we are positive that the worst is, is behind us, uh, but there will be bumps in the road. Uh, always keeping, uh, keeping in mind these imbalances between demand and supplies when you think about labor markets. So when you think about labor markets, you have to think about how the recovery has happened in the last year or so, uh, where there have been skills shortages in some sectors and some sectors have struggled to hire and some sectors have, str have struggled uh, to retain workers. Uh, this is all, again, uh, a demand and supply problem. Uh, and this last year has caused actually the good news that some salaries were increasing, uh, and at least that so, so was reported. Uh, however, because of the sharp increase in prices now, we're seeing that on average, earnings are falling in real terms uh, and when we say falling in real terms, we mean that the cost of living is increasing faster than the earnings. Uh, 
Uh, and this clearly creates a, a great set of challenges, uh, especially in terms of affordability for people. This is something that uh, the government will uh, need to consider uh, in the, their uh, future announcements. Uh, finally, looking at the housing market, once again, always keep in mind and keep in mind throughout the presentation, a lot of the drivers of these changes are the imbalances between demand and supply. The growth in house prices and in rents in the last year or so can be explained to a large degree by the fact that demand has been very strong at the end of the pan uh, uh, during the pandemic, while supply has been good, but not as strong as a matched demand. Uh, this is something that has been common to many sectors, and this is because the pandemic has disrupted supply on many levels. If you think about supermarket shelf, you think about fuel shortages, the, the overall supply is there. It's just difficult to meet demand when demand comes in a wave. And this is the same thing that has happened to the housing market. And this is the same thing that is driving prices and putting price pressure um, on, on people that would want to buy a house. And this create, is creating affordability challenges. If we go to the next slide, we'll just go very quickly where we're going to get a, a macro, a macroeconomic look at this. Uh, and I think I'm acting, I'm, I'm showing this chart and the one in the, in the next slide just to give an idea of how far we've come from this pandemic. Um, so you can see here, this is a chart of the uh, UK gross domestic product, which is the GDP, the size of the economy. Uh, if there is any acronym that we use in this chart that you do not understand, please write it in the chat and we'll pick them up straight away. Uh, but the GDP is the uh, a measure of the size of the economy. You can see this is a monthly chart. Um, and this chart uh, shows that the economy has been basically growing from 97 to 2008. Then there's been a financial crisis uh, and that has been growing since around uh, 2009, all the way to the pandemic. Um, and then you can see the magnitude of the fall in March 2020. But the one thing that I would like you to focus on is how quickly the uh, economy has returned to this pre-pandemic level. So in November 2021, the UK economy was already above, um, was once again above their, their, its level in February 2020. And this is only around one year and a half uh, following that gigantic uh, fall. Uh, this is like this is quite unprecedented as far as recessions go uh, you can see in the very high tech addition that i've made to this graph in the shape of those green lines uh, that in the financial crisis it took much longer to return to the pre-recession peak uh, and while that, this doesn't mean that there are no challenges ahead it just means that the economy and the uk government is a much better state to tackle those challenges because it's not trying to recover from the very big fall that it has had. Uh, so there are positive aspects as well as uh, challenges ahead. And we will cover the challenges extensively. I just wanted to give you a bit of a good news turn to this uh, charts as well. And if you go to the next slide, uh, I'll give another one of these. Uh, so these are two charts that cover the labor market in the UK. Uh, if you look on the left hand chart, this shows unemployment rate as it was forecasted by the Office for Budget Responsibility. Uh, this is the OBR. Um, and you can see in the blue line, uh, sorry, in the green line, this is a chart, the, the line that is at the bottom, this is a chart, uh, this is a, a line that was uh, the, um, forecasted by the OBR uh, in March 2020, excluding the impacts of the pandemic. So in March 2020, the OBR was expecting unemployment rate to be low and to remain low. Um, this is clearly excluding the impact of the pandemic. What has happened when they developed new forecasts looking at the level of the pandemic, they were expecting unemployment. And you can see it in the blue and in the yellow chart. The yellow chart is the following year, March 2021. They were expecting unemployment to really peak and go above 6% a 2% increase in unemployment, a 2 percentage point increase in unemployment is a gigantic increase. Uh, and in October, this had been moderated a bit. Uh, the important thing to look at is the expectation of a rise in unemployment was, were gigantic, but they have never materialized. And this is because there have been very good intervention uh, in this to tackle this specific issue. In this case, this was the furlough scheme. And you can see that this was so successful that even in the October 2021 forecast, which was just a few months ago, uh, they were expecting unemployment to be 
now uh, around 5%, uh, but the latest number we have on unemployment is where the red star is at 4.1. So unemployment really has been a success story. There have been many challenges throughout this pandemic, but the uh, introduction, the timely introduction of the furlough scheme really have shown uh, that a timely intervention can really help and shelter the economy for these external shocks. Uh, and so going forward, we know that potentially there is a way to tackle these challenges. And one of these challenges, and we can see it in the next chart on the right, uh, is the challenges of the cost of living. Uh, so the chart on the right shows the increase or decrease in real uh, earnings, meaning uh, the, the earning uh, uh, that people have net of inflation, net of cost of living. So whether your salaries are going up faster than costs of living is going. And you can see that in the last year, that used to be the case, but in recent months, because of the increasing cost of living, uh, this uh, has really died. And now we are seeing uh, average weekly earnings in, that are falling in real terms, meaning that people are worse off because the cost of living is increasing so fast. This has serious implications uh, for the housing sector in particular, uh, in terms of affordability, but more general for the economy, we will expect to see uh, the government to take action on this because this is a very um, a felt political issue. Uh, and you can see how this will affect uh, expectation in the housing market as well. I'm going to now pass to my colleague, Andrew McWilliam, that will look at what the uh, market insects are uh, for the housing market. Thank you. Thanks, Francesca. Yeah. Welcome, everyone. Um, again, my name's Andrew McWilliam. I'm Homes England Lead on Market Insights in the Research and Analysis team. Let me just move on to the next slide. Yeah, and the next one. Yeah, so so um, as as Franz already alluded to, it's been it's been a big year, um, a significant year in the housing market, particularly on the demand side with records tumbling at every turn and headline house prices, which I'm starting on here, sort of rising sharply throughout the year. You can see on, on the chart here, which is the annual change in UK house prices according to three of, of the house price indices that, that we use from the Nationwide, from the Office of National Statistics and Halifax. We've got the Nationwide and, and Halifax reported UK house price growth on an annual basis finished 2021 at at 10.4% and plus 9.8% respectively, um, which is up from around about between 6 and 7% at the end of, of 2020. The ONS index, which is in the, the red line on the chart, that's around about a month behind. Um, that's up at 10% plus 10% in the year to November 2021, but a little bit lower than the sort of rates we saw in and around the summer period, particularly those recorded in the months immediately preceding each of the tapered stamp duty holiday deadlines, which we'll come on to in a moment. As well as these annual figures, what's quite what's quite interesting is we've seen pretty much five or six consecutive monthly rises, month on month rises in these indexes with momentum broadly being maintained following the end of the stamp duty holiday. And you know the reasons behind that will come on to a in a minute. So, so what are the main factors at play here? Um, and again, this, we'll cover this over the coming slides. But just building on what Francesco has already mentioned, we've you know we've seen a really highly active market with high rates of buyer demand, which hasn't been matched by supply or availability of stock, in particular in the second hand market. That demand and supply imbalance that that we've touched on. We've had the stamp duty holiday, of course, which was extended from its original end deadline in March through to purchases for up to 500,000 up to the end of June and then top for purchases up to 250,000 to the end of September. We've seen extremely low borrowing rates, low mortgage rates, and we've seen in particular, which I think it's quite important, the return of, of higher LTV lending, the numbers of 95% LTV and 90% LTV mortgages are back to the levels that we that we had pre the pandemic. All of this has acted to prompt record some record monthly levels of, of residential transactions in England. The numbers we recorded in March, June and September 
um, prior to each of those stamp duty holiday deadlines were the record levels that, that we'd seen in England, even higher than what we saw in, in March 2016 before the introduction of the 3% um, levy on additional homes. So we finished the year in, in England anyway with the highest total of residential transactions since 2007. Next slide, please, James. So I've met the headline for this is that regional split. So looking at those prices on a regional basis is, is slightly less apparent. When we did one of these sessions in the summer, the headline pretty much at the time that we were seeing over the summer period was that those more affordable markets with a lower case, a, i.e. those were with lower average house prices across the north, were seeing the highest rates of growth whilst others in the south and in particular the east of the countries lagged behind. The latest data is slightly less conclusive. London still lags significantly behind. As you can see on, on the chart, sort of annual rate of house price growth around 5%, not insignificant, but much lower than the other regions. And of course, London continues to have those, the highest average prices around about 520,000 according to the ONS, you know, by some way. But it's that house price growth in those regions in the next tier down in terms of average prices. So in particular, the southeast, the east of England, the southwest, where you've got an average price according to the ONS of somewhere between three and 400,000. They've seen the pace of growth, house price growth accelerate really strongly over the past six months. This will be in part due to some of those things that we've already mentioned, that demand and supply imbalance. And you'll all recognise some of that at a local authority level within your own data. But what we're also seeing a little bit in some of these indexes is the, is the impact of base effects. And, and what I mean by base effects here is that some of these regions didn't see the same speed of growth at the back end of 2020 as we did, say, across the northwest and the northeast. Therefore, the rate of growth at this period now reflects it reflects that. So they're performing very strongly in this period because the rate of growth at the back end of 2020 wasn't quite as fast. Next slide, please, James. And another key feature, I suppose, that, that's been talked about much by commentators on the market has been the divergence between the price growth for houses and flats. And what we've got in the chart here is is the annual change in um, UK house in house prices by product. We've got the price of detached properties and semi-detached properties growing by twice the speed of flats and the this sort of pinkish line, which is plus five percent for flats, which itself is you know the highest rate of growth for flats in the last five years, but nothing compared to what we've seen in terms of detached properties up around fourteen percent, semi-detached around eleven percent growth over the last year. Now, this divergence since the pandemic began has been between the rate of growth between these different products has, has been used as evidence of a change of buyer preferences, the so-called race for space, as it's been dubbed out across the media and across various industry commentators. And there's certainly evidence from the industry and from the online portals of an increase in demand for larger property, home work and space gardens. I think the differential is just as much likely to reflect the smaller effect the pandemics had on wealthier households, households with equity, first time buyers with larger average deposits, households more generally with a greater access to finance and additional service um, savings to fund purchases. These are the households probably as well that are most likely to have been working from home, more likely to have built up savings, more likely to have seen strong wage growth. Without getting too much into the debate to the extent in which the stamp duty saving may have been priced in. There's certainly also, these are also the type of properties where on the face of it have the most to gain from the stamp duty savings with some buyers opting to bring forward purchases or perhaps stretch themselves on slightly higher on price. We've seen some commentary and evidence from like Sir Halifax and, and um, right move over the last couple of months on an increase in demand for flats and a, a, a potential slowdown in this race for space. I think that's in part due to the end of the stamp duty holiday it wouldn't naturally happen but also the return to city centre offices hybrid working model and this is certainly reflected in some of the rental data that we'll come on to in a minute. Next slide please Jen. As we mentioned earlier, you know, what we've seen is a 
really highly active market with high rates of buyer demand, um, particularly compared to the last two or three years prior to the pandemic. Both, you know, it's been seen through data from the online portals and here in these charts reflected in some of the data that we've we've seen from the Royal Institute of Chart Surveyors and their residential market survey. The survey's headline demand index, new buyer inquiries, which you see on the red line on the right hand, um, sorry, the yellow line on, on the right hand chart. It's been strongly, pretty strongly in positive territory over the last 18 months. The only real dips you can see there is it's related to the January or February lockdown in 2021 and the withdrawal of the stamp duty holiday this year. However, near term sales expectations in the, the pink line on the chart and the left hand um, chart, they sort of remain stable and longer term sales expectations are therefore positive. So. Therefore, in the short term, at least, the, the evidence seems to point to the fact that that conversion of demand into sales agreed is being restricted by the supply side of the market, which remains very tight. The RICs themselves reported a net balance of, of minus 14 on new listings in the latest month. That's the, the red line on the chart on the right. And you can see that new instructions, new listings has been in negative territory for, for most of the year. That's the ninth consecutive month negative monthly reading and and the RICS report average stock levels at 14% lower for the agencies registered with them than, than they were at the start of the year. So whilst I think if take looking overall on, on the owner occupied market with, and prices would expect price growth to cool somewhat after that bulge of activity we've seen this summer, but the underlying market for now seems pretty robust and surveyors in the online portals continue to report high levels of buyer demand and alongside that lack of stock, we still think we'll support price growth, albeit at a much lower level than we've seen in, in 2021. Next slide, please, James. One of the feedback for, from the session last time were, that we did in the summer was a bit more detail on the rental market. So we'll try to cover that a little bit more here. We've got the chart here, which is the ONS index of private housing rental prices. This covers um, all private rented properties, not just new lets. That has England up by 1.8% in the year to 2021, not a massive amount, but when you take London out of the data and London, as you can see in, in the dark blue line, is recording, is still recording the rental contraction according, according to this index. Um, it shows prices grew by 2.8% and you can see that line, England excluding London, you know, given that this includes all private rents, not just new ones. It's pretty strong growth really over, over the last um, year and they've grown pretty steadily. All the RICs, uh, the data from the ONS, right move, Zupo, the main online portals all shown strong upward pressure on private rents, stemming from rising tenant demand and a severe shortage of stock and, uh, you know, arguably even more acute than in, than in the sales market. Thinking of, of some of that data um, that we've got access to from Rightmove, you know, the, the that we have access to from Rightmove internally, we've seen some of the volume of rental listings nationally, which is a pretty good proxy for, for new rental supply coming onto the market, has remained sort of broadly around about 10 to 20 percent down on 2019 levels from much of the year. Um, and you know, as as many of you logged on today will know, you know, there's there's significant of of concentrations of local authorities where rental supply coming onto the market has fallen at a much faster pace than that national average. We're, we're, there's early evidence of you know areas, particularly around national parks, coastal communities in the southwest, central areas in the east, where supply at times in terms of listings coming on was down by sort of 20 or 30 percent or more compared to what we saw pre-pandemic. That's clearly playing a significant role in pushing up rental prices and lower numbers of rental properties will, you know, indeed make some of these indicators more volatile, but it's certainly evidence of, of that link. We've also got colleagues who work in, in some areas where they've received anecdotal evidence from partners on landlords switching properties out of the mainstream rental market potentially into holiday lets and that sort of appears to have been maintained following the end of the, the peak domestic holiday season. Quite interesting to see whether, whether people see that that's still continuing to happen in their areas. 
Next slide, please, James. Asking rates, well, you know that that those higher rates in the ONS index. We just put on a, just a link to the to Right Moves Rental Price Tracker. Um, here on this slide, are, are clearly being reported in those commercial indices as well. Um, right move up 8.6 percent on the third quarter of of 2020 2021. Um, Greater GB excluding Greater London. Um, you know they've they've got. The diff slight difference between the ONS index and this one is they've got the, the rents bottoming out in 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 London, where you know they've reported a rent rise in London for the first time since the pandemic. I think what we what we're pretty clear on is that we've seen in these commercial indexes a, a sharp rise in rental market activity in UK, UK city centres over the during quarter two and quarter three in 2021, and that easing of lockdown restrictions linked to the sort of usual boost in rental market activity seen over the summer months, usually peaking in August into September as student tenancies kicked in. And we've seen tenant demand up by over 30 percent up to September, over September 2020 in Manchester, Birmingham, Leeds, Nottingham, and you know, some of those um, core city, city centre markets. And that's having a knock on effect on city centre rents and has pretty much reversed the falls that we saw in the first 12 months on, of the pandemic. I think what overall thinking, looking back to what Francesco said earlier, what what is clear is that in the longer term, this remains, you know, whilst these sort of figures remain ahead of average earnings, the greater concern that housing affordability in any tenure could continue to suffer. Next slide, please, James. So I couldn't run this presentation this morning without touching in a little bit more detail on inflation and you know as we move towards the end you know there's, there's some big numbers in the previous section but we move towards the end of 2021 the significant headwinds that are likely to have an impact on the market as we move forward over the ne next couple of months Fran's already mentioned the pandemic but with inflation on the rise and you know the Bank of England rise, raising interest rates that's certainly having an impact on sentiment it, this is important as overall sentiment is vulnerable and is likely to have an impact on demand for housing and potentially stall the, the pace of house price growth this year, which Imran will come on to in more detail in the next section. What we know is that inflation in the CPI measure reached 5.4% in the last month. That's the highest for almost 30 years. You can see on that left hand chart, which is contributions to, to that inflation rate, the biggest annual in you know, increases were in housing and household services and transport down to high fuel prices. Where prices of essential goods and services are rising, that's bad news for the economy, clearly, and it, it eats into household spending power and cuts real income. What we also know as well is that there's potentially further pressure on inflation coming on the horizon in April with the next hike in the energy cap and the return to VAT of 20% on the hospitality sector. Overall, that means that the consensus is that inflation will reach around 6% in spring, will subside potentially when fuel prices and supply disruptions ease thereafter. So what does that mean? Next slide, sorry, James. So what does this mean for lending and for mortgage rates? Well, high loan to value mortgage rates you see on the chart, which is, which is um, two year fixed term mortgage rates. Higher loan to value rates, so those 95, 90, 85, we've seen they've dropped pretty universally and pretty sharply since September 2020. Rates on 95, average rates on a 95% loan are now below the pre pandemic rates. Despite the fact that of the threat of the Omicron variant, we know that the Bank of England raised interest rates to 0.25% in December. The rise in rates at lower LTVs, which you can see on the chart, which have started to dip up, the sort of 60, 75 percent isn't really a surprise given that the market is pricing in interest rate rises over the next few months. We also expect new mortgage rates will continue to remain lower than the historic average, even at higher LTVs. But we're entering an interest rate rising environment, and that's important because that'll have a knock on effect on sentiment. More widely, I think, you know, what we've been used to 
in the housing market is consistently low mortgage rates over the last decade and indeed the last year, and that's helped support higher house prices. You know, the, the, the Bank of England does the average five year fix across all LTVs at around that's been running pretty much between two and three and a half percent since 2016. So that's hit a low of two percent in recent months. So even if we had a rise of interest rates of, of half percent or even up to one percent, it still keeps them potentially within the range recorded over the last five or six years. It's also quite important to note that regulation in mortgage lending since 2014 has stopped lower borrowing costs from so far anyway, creating an unsustainable boom in house prices. The market's better insulated from higher mortgage rates than it was in the past, but not immune. Um, and we'll come on to this in the next slide, please. What we know is um, that the consensus among economists is that interest rates will rise further over the coming year. Um, a central bank scale that support back from the economy and look to normalise interest rates and manage inflation. Imran will come on to that in a bit more detail shortly, but depending on the scale of that increase, this may have implications for future house price inflation and affordability levels. What I've included on this slide, and it's worth seeking out, is to assess its impact the Office of Budget Responsibility, the OBR Model 2 inflation scenarios alongside its latest forecast um, in at the end towards the end of last year. Each model projected inflation to reach 5.4%, around about what it is now, and for interest rates to rise to 3.5% in an attempt to curtail it. If you look on the left hand chart, which has the outcome for house prices, that differs substantially depending on the cause of price rises if it's driven by wages. Um, so the dark blue line or purple line, house prices increase above the central projection at an annual rate of 4%. If it's driven by rising product costs, the type that we're seeing at the moment, which is, it, it's, is the paler blue line, household incomes are squeezed and causes a fall in prices in 2022-23 with an average growth of, of just 2% per annum over the period of, of that scenario. What we still think is that the risk, and slightly reflecting the stress test um, chart on the right hand side, the risk of destabilizing the market is low. In particular, with, you know, in, in quarter three this year, around 80% of mortgages are still at fixed rate and won't be hit too quickly. Therefore, a lot of existing homeowners for now would, with mortgages, will be insulated, I suppose, from that initial payment shock for some time. I think since 2018, Fixed interest rates for five years has become more popular than, than two years. And I think we're up to now five year fixes take up around about 46% of mortgage advances according to UK finance. Therefore, for a larger number, the interest rate, any interest rate rises in, in 2021 or, or in, incoming will not affect their payments for a number for a few years yet, by which time economic conditions may well have evolved considerably and that squeeze on household finances may have eased. But if they revert back to the variable rate, the regulated 3% stress test means that most should be able to meet those rising repayments, even if, you know, of course, cause difficulties, particularly if, if the squeeze on finance is easy and, and the labour market remains robust. On top of that, there's, there's still very strong competition in, in the mortgage market and that strong competition for business might mean that the full pass through, uh, you might likely to bear down on the full pass through of, of bank rate rises. So all this is, I suppose, is good news for market stability for the meantime, if, if not necessarily for affordability. Next slide, please, Jane. The other aspect of inflation and the, the, probably the, sec the other big story of 2021 has been on the lack of availability and rising costs of materials and building supplies which have threatened to the pace and capacity for building. We've had the latest data from the Office of National Statistics on producer price inflation shows some eye water in figures. Um, producer output prices grew by 9.3% over 2021, which you know, those output prices allowed further pressure on consumer price inflation. Um, almost more importantly for input, pr input prices into factories are up 
13 and a half percent than they were a year earlier that's slightly down from from some of the picks we saw uh, um in sort of october november partly because of crude oil prices have come down a little bit however those increasing costs of metals higher oil prices have had a major contribution to the annual rise and in the construction sector in particular high fuel energy and raw material prices have pushed up average cost burdens as we move through 2021 However, the latest IHS market CIPS construction purchasing managers index, which these charts on, on, on the slide come from, has some slightly more positive news in that, you know, the number of construction firms reporting supplier delays has dropped slightly as we move towards the year end. Similarly, there's early sign that the, the chart on the left hand side that delivery times and lead times are starting to level out as well where there are longer wait times reported um it's primarily due to international shipping delays and shortages of hgv drivers however the, there's been more, as many of you have seen there's been more in the press over the last couple of days of renewed issues with global supply chains from from omicron break outbreaks and continuing delays at ports so you know the, the sort of the easing that we saw in november and december may may take a little more while to come to fruition than, than we'd previously hoped. Um, what you see on the left hand side is that there's a slight dip in input prices as those supply shortages eased on the chart on the left hand side. So that price inflation slightly easing, albeit still firmly in in positive territory. Next slide. So finally in this section, what does that mean in terms of our in terms of the housing market and the supply in terms of new build so you know our early indicators of supply suggest that the availability and cost of supplies have been a bigger hindrance on the pace of completions than starts the chart we've got here which is new build energy performance certificates logged lodged in england which is you know we 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 think is a pretty good proxy for housing completions and very timely as well it was available on a weekly basis you can see in the yellow line, which is 2021 by, by week, it dipped quite significantly over the final final quarter of, of, of 2021 after performing pretty strongly in comparison to the previous years up till then. So what we saw, the t so where, where we finished is uh, in the year to, to the end of 2021, we, 2021 finished the year at 3.8% lower than the total recorded in 2019. So that's around about 246,000 new build dwellings lodged in England in 2021 compared to around about 255,000 in 2019, which was um, when looking at the net additional dwellings, the official housing statistics has been our recent peak. The good news is that if supply issues do ease a little, that could help the level of completions over the first quarter of 2022. However, expectations of a slower market are likely to bear down on new starts in the short term which are expected to finish 2021 broadly in line with 2019 levels this is starts but they have been on this on a slightly downward trajectory um over the last um, few months as well albeit as i mentioned not quite had as had as big impact so far Thank you, everyone. I'll pass over to Imran for. Oh, sorry, I'll pass over to Francesco actually first for our and look on our near term expectations for 2022. Thanks, Andrew. And I will ask only Rory to help me out with this because we have um, a little poll for you to respond to. And if you go to the next slide, you'll see you should see the question, um, the questions, and then the poll. So these are the questions that we're going to ask. Uh, we're going to ask what your expectation for house prices um, in the next three months. What do you expect them to de decrease um, by um, to what extent? And then the following question is about the state of your local economy, so the economy of where you're based. Um, and just so you know, these are questions um, that we ask regularly to colleagues internally. We've been running uh, a sentiment survey uh, to Homes England co colleagues internally. This is. Uh, a relatively good base. Uh, we wouldn't claim that it's representative, uh, but we have colleagues based all across England. Uh, and we compare the results to the survey to the actual outturn of the data. And we'll show the results later and we'll see how you fare against um, our colleagues. 
so if we can go to the next question, uh, which should be um, the how do we uh, how do you think the economy in your region? Yeah, here it is. It's in your screen now. So if you can please, what do you think the economy in your region will look like in the next three months? You know, will it increase? Will it decrease? Uh, and then we'll go through what actually uh, is our house view, or rather the view of our colleagues internally, and um, how they have done in the past at predicting this. Quite a lot of you respond, 170 responses, that's very good. Um, I'm gonna ask um, my colleagues in the back to provide a net balance of the responses so that we can we know uh, where um, our attendees, where our audience stands. So I think we've had quite a few responses already. Uh, if we can move to the next slide, I can start thinking about, there we go. So this is um, the results. We ask this question every month and we've been asking these questions every month since 2019. You can see that the responses from our, um, uh, from our internal sentiment survey are in dark green whereas the light green lines are uh, the actual data. So if you focus on the left-hand chart, so what do our colleagues think about house prices uh, compared to what has actually happened? Uh, so we can see that our colleagues are relatively quite good at understanding the trend. Uh, so you know when, when they think they're going up, they actually are going up. And keep in mind, they say this three months in advance. Uh, so this is quite, you know, this is quite good. And I've moved the data so that it shows that um, they actually match quite well. So we uh, are quite confident that whenever we see uh, our colleagues that work in local markets seeing an uptick in demand, uh, this is quite this is what's happening. Uh, but you can definitely see how this is the expectation for 2022 early on as well from our colleagues. Uh, and this is what so far has been happening as well. So there, there is an expectation that prices will continue to grow. Uh, in the next few months, uh, and I think as we have Andrew touched upon already, this is because demand and supply are imbalanced. There is quite strong demand almost everywhere still. I think what's interesting to look at as well is uh, the views on, and we'll, we'll touch upon where you stand in terms of uh, your views compared to our house views and what has actually happened in, in a minute. Um, looking at the local economy, uh, you can see our views are uh, if you can, if you can say so, much more negative than the actual outturn. Uh, so you can see that our views for the economy, the internal views were quite negative for over 2020, uh, but uh, monthly GDP was quite boring in 2020, it was increasing a bit, uh, but not significantly. Uh, you can see the bump in our views in uh, early 2020 before the pandemic. Uh, you may remember the, the Boris bump, that was the, uh, increase the uh, improvement in sentiment following the 2019 election. Uh, however, that did not materialize in the data because the pandemic hit in tw March 2020. And so you can see they have been tracking uh, the impact ever since. Uh, what's interesting is that while the um, economy has been recovering, uh, the number of local restrictions that have been, uh, that been imposed, so the tiers last year, uh, but now even like localized uh, lockdowns mean that the view on the economic expectation is still positive for 2022, but it is deteriorating. You can see that the, the green, dark green line is is, is pointing downwards. Um, so hopefully our colleagues tend to be right, but hopefully they are not right about the fact that 2022 uh, doesn't look to be uh, as good as, as the past few months. Uh, so I'm just out looking, hoping to, that someone will um, feed me the results uh, for the survey to see where you score. Uh, I can see that the majority of you think that the economy will be increasing, a small increase uh, in the next few months. So you actually are in agreement with our colleagues. Uh, and once again, this appeared good. Looking at the net balance, I believe you are slightly less positive than they are, but I'm asking for my question for my colleagues. And looking at the house prices, you're bang on with our colleagues as well. So this is not too difficult, but uh, we'll have to check, double check in three months time if when the new uh, data come in, uh, if that is actually the case, because as you can see, our colleagues have a track record of over two years, whereas this is your first stab at it. But uh, as you'll see now with my colleague Imran looking, uh, talking through our forecast for the uh, economy, 
uh, the key to forecasting is to do that often and to never trust what your uh, what the forecast is uh, and to do that regularly. So uh, hopefully uh, that would be helpful for you at the local level as well. Imran, can I pass on to you? Great, uh, thanks, Great. Man. Uh, thanks man. Um, so we've seen kind of, uh, you know, fans talk through kind of what our partners are thinking about the uh, kind of short term outlook. And we've seen kind of how how our audience here uh, compares to that to that too and, and, and very aligned, which is uh, which is great. So what I'm going to do now is just kind of talk through some of this um, in a bit more detail and, and kind of outline our view of kind of the future and our approach as a as a research team here in Homes England to economic forecasting. So, um, like all forecasters, I'm going to start off with a with a well written a, a caveat, uh, which is that you know we're not you know we're not forecasters, uh, in you know uh, you know we're not trained forecasters, we're not psychics, uh, for that matter. You know we are a delivery agency first and foremost. So in forecasting, we focus on understanding what different scenarios and risks means to us as a delivery agency. So what does that mean for our programs? you know, for our projects and for our aims and objectives as, uh, as an agency. So what that this translates to is that, you know, it's not all about uh, what the numbers are for each each indicator. It's much more about kind of what the story is for the different scenarios. What's the logic chain? You know, what's the implications for different areas of the business? So kind of it's the first part in terms of kind of the story and the narrative that I'm going to focus on over, over the next few slides. Is that's kind of the much more interesting part um, of forecasting. So um, here, uh, next slide, please, James. So what we've got here are kind of uh, kind of macroeconomic uh, forecasts. So these are based off of Oxford Economics, who are a kind of internationally recognised um, forecasting agency, um, and this is uh, the, their latest forecast as at December 2021. So this, just to caveat, this doesn't take into account the very la latest kind of data and announcement. So principally that includes the removal of kind of plan B restrictions, but it also doesn't take into account of the increase in the uh, Bank of England base rate uh, that was announced in December. But, you know, as I talk through this, I'll touch on what, you know, what are the implications that has. So firstly, just kind of uh, taking an overall um Kind of an overall view you know the forecasts do show that the econ the economy will re recover strongly um in 2022 and beyond you know there's a better kind of public health outlook easing restrictions and you know the extension of fiscal support have all underpinned a faster economic reopening um in recent months that that was anticipated at the start of 2021 and that's kind of fed through into the forecasts for the next year and beyond but one thing we have to know is the recovery kind of remains kind of compositionally narrow. And what I mean by that is, you know, Fran said at the start that it's been characterised by an imbalance between supply and demand. And what that means here is, you know, it's uh, the recovery has been swayed by kind of sectoral and regional imbalances. Um, so demand is exceeding supply um, in, you know, widely in some areas of the economy, but it's lagging in many others. So now just looking at um, some of these charts, you'll see that you'll see lots of lines on these charts. So uh, the kind of the bright green one is our is our kind of is our central scenario. And that's what we're expecting to happen. Then we have kind of a more optimistic scenario, our upside scenario. And then we have a, a downside scenario, which is a kind of a pessimistic view. Um, and what I'll do is I'll I'll talk through I'll talk through each of the scenarios shortly when I get onto some of the housing market indicators. But for now, I'm just going to focus on what 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 we consider to be our kind of central case, um, our central case uh, uh, forecasts. So on the left, we've got um, GDP forecasts, uh, you know, percentage change year on year. And what's this showing is that in our central scenario, um, output is forecast to grow by five percent um, in 2022, and then two and a half percent. Um, in 2023 and then it's going to trend back to around one and a half percent growth per year um, for the rest of the forecast period to 2027. So that's broadly in line with the average um, that we saw from kind of 2017 to 19 but it's it is lower than the early part of kind of 20 you know the early part of 2010s that we saw. You know why there's, you know there's a few reasons for that but that's mainly can be summarized by the idea that you know we're going to enter uh, what we think is an is an economic adjustment period um, in the medium term. So, you know, I've said, you know, economic activity has been characterised by kind of imbalances uh, during the pandemic. And while some of these effects have, have eased as the economy has reopened, you know, many of these appear kind of increasingly persistent 
and we think that will result in a kind of in a reconfiguration in uh, in in the economic structure, certainly in terms of trade and certain se uh, certain sectors. But I'll touch a bit more on this when I talk about some of the risks. But a good way to, I think that's been, that's captured this is the Institute for Fiscal Studies. They've characterised the economic recovery as as essentially a you know a, as as a four episode process. You know, episode one was was lockdown adjustment. Uh, episode two was a uh, a reopening rebound. Episode three is a kind of lingering caution, which is you know we'd argue we're kind of towards the end, and we're moving in to. Uh, episode four, which is termed kind of medium term adjustment. And it's this, you know, this adjustment, which is why we think uh, growth is going to trend to just one and a half percent in this forecast period. So that's economic output. Now, on the right hand side, we've got our unemployment forecasts, which shows kind of, uh, you know, certainly initially quite a, you know, quite a big fall in the unemployment rate, settling then to around three and a half, uh, 3.8 percent. Um, for the rest of the forecast period. Now, this is, I know I've kind of, uh, you know, Fran touched on this earlier, but this is quite remarkable uh, given what the economy has has been through over the last few years. And it's much lower than the rates that we saw, that the unemployment rates we saw prior to 2015. Um, you know, this is, you know, mainly as a result of kind of, you know, the, the fiscal support and the furlough scheme. But it's also to do with kind of some sectors remaining very resilient uh, during the recovery. Um, and indeed, you know, in some cases, increasing demand in, you know, in in some sectors. So that's kind of what's what's driven behind. That's kind of dri the driver behind the, this kind of forecasted low unemployment rate. If we go on to the on to the next slide, uh, please, we've got kind of the other side of the story um, and, you know, characterised here by two key indicators, which is inf inflation on the left hand side and earning growth on the right hand side. So these charts show what we think are the key risks to, you know, to economic health in, in, in our forecast, which are, you know, high levels of inflation and particular types of inflation, um, which will kind of increase the living costs uh, and combined with kind of uh, lower earning growth, kind of erode household um, purchasing power and, and, and finances. So, you know, I must add these forecasts were done in, in December um, so that the chart on the left shows forecasts, uh, shows the inflation forecast peaking at 5% um, in, in April 2022. I think given what we know now since these forecasts were undertaken, uh, this is probably underplaying what that peak will be. Um, and, you know, we should arguably expect higher levels of inflation, possibly peaking to around 6% um, in April before falling back to an average level of around 4.5% um, this year before kind of then trending back towards the kind of long-term kind of 2% uh, target uh, and indeed rate that we're, that we're forecasting. Now, there are two key uh, points here that I just want to focus on. First is that, you know, in, in our view, kind of so far, the drivers of, of this inflation seems uh, temporary. So it's kind of uh, energy prices, uh, you know, base effects, trade disruption and imported inflation. So these effects, um, you know, we think they're temporary. They could prove sticky in the medium term, but we think they would they would ultimately, um, you know, they should ultimately dissipate uh, eventually. We think the larger risk here is probably a more persistent, uh, domestically driven price surge. Um, for now, you know, we we don't think there are the risk, you know, there are risks to that at the moment. We think they're fairly subdued. Um, because at the moment, accelerating inflation is kind of currently being just driven by a by a handful of of mainly kind of imported goods. Well, service inflation at the moment, in particular, is subdued. But you know, again, that is a uh, there are many moving parts. So that's our view at this point in time. Um, again, you know, we'll know clearer kind of as we move into into the you know into the rest of 2022. We'll see kind of uh, where 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 we are. If we move on to the next slide, please. Um, that was kind of our just a couple of indicators in terms of the overall economy. I'm now going to focus a bit more uh, on some of our kind of key housing market related indicators. And here is where I'll, I'll shortly talk through in a bit more detail some of the scenarios. But here we've got house price forecasts um, and this is kind of an index of house prices. So kind of indexed uh, to prices in 2015. Um, so again, focusing first on the bright green line in the center, this is our, again, central scenario and primarily what we're expecting to happen. So here, 
Um, you know, whilst we know the withdrawal of the kind of, you know, stamp duty land tax relief has taken some steam out of the market, uh, the, res the resilience of the, of the labour market and, you know, savings that have accumulated during lockdown are still kind of supporting that market. But we've got rising living costs, which will mainly affect uh, household finance, but also confidence. You know, those two points together means we think house prices will be relatively flat in 2022. So we're forecasting growth of just 0.3% uh, house price growth in 2022. Um, so we think they're going to be flat, but also, you know, with low borrowing rates and a continued desire to invest in housing assets and the attractiveness of housing assets, we do think that will support demand. And so the risk of a, of a sharp correction in prices has evaporated, certainly in our in our central scenario. We think this kind of this relatively flat growth will continue into 2024 with growth of just 0.8% uh, uh, year on year. And then we think it's going to accelerate into 2025 to around uh, kind of 3.5% and then 4% by 2026. So, we, you know, we're calling that acceleration, but it puts into context the growth we've had, you know, that, the growth in pr health prices we've had, uh, you know, double digit growth we've seen in the last year. So that's kind of our, you know, our, our kind of our central view of, of where we think house prices are going. But we do have to consider other risks and scenarios. So if we first look at the um, the dark green line, of kind of uh, that's that's at the top, um, which is kind of our an optimistic view. Um, and then we've got the below the kind of the mustard yellow line is our more kind of pessimistic view. And again, these are based off uh, Oxford economics and the, and the scenarios that they produce and we, and we adapt them for the housing market. So firstly, taking the upside um, here, we, you know, we in, in this scenario, um, economic growth is higher. Primarily due to um, a, what we're calling a consumer boom. So that is uh, pent up demand from households spending uh, kind of into uh, an economy that has much less restrictions than it has had um, over the past couple of years. And that combined, you know, breeds confidence and that underpins housing demand. So this coupled with the healthy labour market, which kind of removes the risks of um, a high number of forced sales, um, that improves expectations and confidence, um, meaning house price growth of around 1.7% in 2022. Uh, again, 1.7% uh, in 2023, and then over 3% per year for the rest of the forecast period. But it, obviously, in this scenario, affordability does worsen as prices rise. So that's put, say, kind of a natural break on the uh, and a limit on kind of the growth in prices we see we see in this scenario. So this scenario is all about essentially consumer confidence and consumer spending um, continuing to support um, a housing market, albeit at lower levels than we've seen over the past year. In our in our downside scenario, so again looking at the kind of the more uh, kind of the, see the kind of the yellow, yellow line at the bottom, this in this scenario there are kind of there are new variants and um, kind of new restrictions, um, which kind of causes a slowdown in in economic activity. So here, kind of GDP growth is is therefore much lower, and there is kind of more what we're calling longer term economic damage um, from the pandemic whilst the economy adjusts. So that's skills issues, that's higher unemployment, and it's uh, lower income. So here, this kind of higher unemployment to lower income uh, causes house prices to fall slightly in 2022, and then uh, a much more kind of dramatic fall of, you know, 3.7% in 2023 as those effects start to shape, take shape and feed through into the housing market, um, with kind of house price growth levels not, you know, not recovering to current levels until 2025. So this is our much more kind of uh, pessimistic scenario. One thing I will say is that, um, you know, at the moment, we think the likelihood of, the, uh, of our kind of our central scenario is probably around 60 percent. That's what we think. And then 20 percent each to our kind of uh, upside and downside scenario. And obviously we continue to review that as we as we produce our forecasts. I just want to touch on one other point, which is you'll see kind of the red dotted line, which is the um, OBR's forecasts that were done in October. And you can see all the scenarios are much more pessimistic compared to what we saw then in October. And that's mainly due to kind of the emergence of uh, kind of Omicron and the restrictions and then also the higher levels of inflation and reduced confidence since that point, um, which kind of breeds uncertainty. And that's kind of put a great a break on the growth we expected, uh, the OBR expected uh, back in October. If we go on to the next slide, please, um, we are now, uh, this shows kind of transactions now. Um, you know, tr 
2021 was a headline year for transaction, as, as kind of Andrew has covered. Um, we think 2022 is going to be much more cooled off, um, almost like a temporary breather before kind of much before kind of much more rapid activity again later on in the forecast period. So again, in our kind of central our central view is that um, you know the number of deals that were brought forward uh, in, 20, in 2021. Um, partially due to the kind of stamp duty holiday means transactions in 2022 are likely to be around 20% lower than in 2021. Um, so I'm sure kind of the uh, the estate agents and conveyances are, are breathing a, a sigh of relief um, kind of before settling then to around um, 1.3 million kind of transactions uh, per annum by 2025 and onwards. We think you know, despite that kind of uh, the reduction in activity, low interest rates will continue to mean investments for yield is, is, is attractive. Again, in our upside, we've got them transacted activity slightly higher, um, kind of mainly due to the, the, the supportive economic background and the higher confidence. Um, but again, there is a limit reflect and that limit reflects kind of the um, the limited growth in the actual stock of, of, of dwellings. And then in, in the downside, um, you know, the poor economic conditions and environment uh, means um, essentially a smaller risk appetite from lenders um, and that kind of reduces activity in the market. So in the downside scenario, uh, we're forecasting less than one million transactions in 2022, recovering gradually then back to that kind of 1.3 million uh, by 2026. So overall, kind of, you know, to summarise here, you know, there is convergence to a level of transactions of about 1.3 million by 2025 per year, but it's the kind of it's how we get there between that. That is the difference in each of the scenarios. But regardless, we are expecting, uh, you know, we are forecasting a kind of a, a fairly significant fall in the level of activity um, in 2022. If we go on to the next slide, please, uh, just turning to. Um, I'll kind of find an indicator just on um, housing, uh, on kind of housing supply. So we saw in 2021, the number of housing starts recovered to 165,000 um, and expected to carry on climbing throughout the force for uh, throughout this kind of forecast period to reach kind of uh, levels we saw pre the, you know, the greater financial crisis of around 195,000 um, by 2023. And we think it's going to stay at this level through the rest of the forecast period. Again, this is, you know, the resilience of the labour market uh, and increased confidence in a stable housing market values that's likely to be supportive. But again, builders will be aware of uh, supp supply pressures and um, the squeeze on household incomes, uh, certainly in the short term. So again, just uh, looking at our more optimistic uh, scenario, um, again, you know, there's the, the more kind of uh, positive economic situation and health makes house builders less cautious about price falls. And so new starts will increase even th further, reaching 195,000 uh, by 2024. This is slightly higher than the tenancy scenario, but not that much higher because that just reflects the natural ceiling, ceiling of the market and, and kind of um, an, an output and capacity in supply. In terms of the uh, downside scenario, we think that, you know, even under more challenging economic conditions, you know, starts are still forecast to recover. Um, you know, they'll increase from uh, to 182,000 next year, uh, climbing to uh, 192,000 by 2026. So just slightly lower than the potential scenario and taking a little bit longer to actually get there. You know, we think in this scenario, it's not necessarily just about the numbers, it's about the type um, also the type of supply. So, you know, un under our downside scenario, there'll be much more demand for social and affordable housing, um, you know, particularly as lower income households will be hit hardest by, um, in this scenario, the restrictions uh, on work, on rising inflation and on higher debt costs. So, you know, that could influence the type of housing starts too. But again, um, you know, that's getting into quite a bit of level of detail in terms of the forecast that at the moment we just uh, don't have all this too much uncertainty to actually model that. One thing I'll just I'll just note is that, you know, all the scenarios are higher than, uh, you know, project housing starts um, higher than what the OBR projected in October. Um, and that's mainly due to kind of the slight recovery we've seen in, um, you know, material costs and supply chain issues. Noting, though, that's, you know, st some still are persistent. Um, and also that demand for housing has kind of remained stronger than expected beyond the stamp duty land tax holiday. Um, and, you know, we assume that kind of persists over over the forecast period. Now, if we move on to the next slide, please, just just to kind of finalise, I just want to recap some of the risks 
uh, that's been mentioned throughout this uh, throughout this uh, this this session. Um, just to explicitly set out what we as a research team uh, are particularly wary of and are looking out for over the coming year and what we think will um, influence the forecasts and which of our scenarios that you know will actually occur. So naturally, I think, you know, um, top of the list are kind of, you know, new variants and, and, and kind of the, the implications of that. You know, we saw with uh, the Omicron variant that they will come with, you know, variants will come with different challenges. Um, whether that's more severe in terms of kind of hospitalizations and the, and, and the death rate, whether it's different, worse in different kinds of symptoms, uh, more infectious or kind of uh, level of, you know, how immune it is to, to, to vaccines and boosters. Again, it's a, it's a bit of an unknown, <laughs> to put it lightly. So this is then the biggest source of uncertainty, um, kind of, the, you know, the, the number and, and the nature of new, new variants and then also kind of what will the policy response be? Uh, that's kind of you know the key source to us uh, as risk. The next point I want to talk, just touch on the next risk is uh, trade friction, and that's here kind of for we see as two main reasons. Firstly, is that you know we're still waiting to understand the full effects of of Brexit. Um, you know we're arguably at the beginning of a uh, kind of a period of acute structural change within UK trade. And, you know, we are wondering kind of what will that structure look like? Um, so that's again, that's another source of kind of trade friction and uncertainty. The other point is also uh, here is what are other countries response to what, what will their ongoing response be to coronavirus? Because that will have an impact on the economy, given the globalized and connected nature of, um, of, of, of supply chains. You know, as an example, we've seen China pursuing and sticking to their zero COVID policy. Um, so even if we kind of as a country are, you know, quote unquote, living with with COVID, others may not be. And that is a risk to supply chains and then to, and, and then to, and then to our economy. On a similar vein, you know, we've put supply constraints here as as a key risk. You know, we heard over uh, a lot over the last year about, you know, material costs and delays. Um, at, and we know kind of it doesn't take much to cause delays in delays in supply and the knock-on effect that has. So again, that that remains a key risk. But there's also kind of a much more uh, that was a, a, a more practical point. But in terms of kind of a higher level point in terms of the market, you know, we know there are challenges uh, faced by house builders when they're faced with kind of rapid and big changes in the scale, type, and location of demand for housing. So as an example, you know, um, you could you know you could argue that house build, house builders have been preparing for a post help to buy market um, with you know characterized by you know smaller and, and, and kind of more affordable you know cheaper homes. Um, whilst the you know the pre-pandemic market kind of uh, pointed towards stronger demand in the Midlands and the north of England, what we've actually seen is that transaction of the fastest for the more kind of high more expensive homes in the south of England. Um, so that's kind of a big that, that's 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 a big that's a big shift uh, in in kind of in, in in demand and preferences, and then there are other uncertainty uh, uh, that's that's in the market as as well around kind of um, planning reforms and, and and building safety. So that's likely to be a source of risk for housing supply. You know, we've touched on inflation multiple times during this uh, during this session. Um, you know, we've outlined this. You know, we've outlined our forecast for the for this above. But just worth reiterating, uh, just given how significant a risk uh, this is and the knock on impacts it will have, particularly on on household finance. You know, we've said above that the drivers for this uh, seem temporary, but the key risk uh, going forward is more about kind of inflation expectation. Um, you know, if these begin to shift up, that could result in firms willing to accept uh, kind of uh, high wages and offer higher prices, uh, you know, creating the potential for a genuine wage price spiral. And then finally, uh, we've got a risk here as kind of scarring and economic damage. So we've seen the economy kind of certainly in terms of, of unemployment and output has come through the pandemic relatively well. But there are kind of underlying risks that might not get picked up in some of the indicators we've touched on today. So that's particularly around kind of skill imbalances, um, you know, uh, skill shortages that could rear their head in the medium term. And then we've got this theme, you know, we've been talking about this, this idea of an imbalance between demand and supply and kind of an imbalance in the in the recovery. 
you know, the recovery has been characterized by, you know, big differences in the performance and prospects of sectors. So we think that there'll be, you know, we're determining this kind of winners and losers. There'll be, uh, there'll be, you know, some sectors that will, that will be kind of optimistic and some kind of certainly more pessimistic. Just an ex- as an example, I, I, you know, I read this morning that firms in transport and storage expect sales to be around 5% higher. Uh, in the long term as a result of the pandemic, but hospitality firms expect them to be 5% lower. So that just kind of gives an example of uh, there's going to be, a, we think, a protracted period of reconfiguration in the economy. And then finally, uh, just in terms of interest rates, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty about the outlook for this in 2022. We've not marked this as a key risk here. Um, and that's because I think, as Andrew had mentioned, um, you know, the, the majority of existing um, mortgage holders are well insulated from any immediate increase in mortgage rates, given the high proportion on fixed rate mortgages over kind of longer periods. Um, and then also kind of the current affordability criteria and mortgage regulation suggests, you know, recent buyers are well placed to cope with kind of higher mortgage rates. So that's a very kind of quick summary of um, our view of the future. I want to, you know, thank you all for, you know, for listening. I appreciate that. That's, you know, there's there's a lot there's a lot that was in there. Uh, I'm now going to pass back over to to Rory, who's going to go through um, some of the questions you you you've posted for us. Brilliant. Thank you very much for that, Imran, and also thank you to Andrew and to Francesco as well for a really insightful and engaging session. Uh, as Imran said, I'm going to facilitate the Q&A session now where I'll be inviting all of our three presenters um, to answer questions that were posted in the chat during that session. I think our team did quite a sterling job actually of answering quite a lot of the questions uh, in the chat already, so it'll be a bit of a challenge to find ones that haven't been answered, but uh, I will do my best. Um, I think the first one I'm going to go to is Francesco for a question that states, uh, to what extent have the leaseholder experiences post Grenfell uh, impacted on or expected to impact on uh, the markets for sales of leasehold flats? Uh, this is a very good question and it's a question that unfortunately we're not uh, um, able to answer fully simply because we can't disentangle the different effects that have happened uh, that are happening in the meantime since Grenfell. Uh, and the reason for that is that most leasehold uh, uh, owners of leasehold properties uh, probably did not have the upper hand during the pandemic, uh, as in their properties that they were willing to sell not only may have had problems in selling, but also they weren't the properties that people wanted to buy. And you may have heard of the race for space in which the majority of the demand was for larger properties and for properties that maybe would have had, ac- would have had access uh, to uh, green areas. And because of that, uh, yes, flats and leasehold properties have underperformed the market, uh, but we are not able to say whether that was the Grenfell effect or whether there were other underlying causes in the market. Brilliant, thank you very much for that, Francesco. Uh, I'm going to go now to Andrew. Uh, there's a question around the fact that there's been some reports of second homeowners switching to private rental uh, to reduce some of the tax requirements. Uh, have you got any comments on this? I think you're probably best place to answer this, I think. Thanks, Roy. Um, I'm not, I'm sure that there are examples of that occurring, but certainly in the higher level data that that we've got access to, there won't necessarily be any evidence that we would see within within the data sets that we're monitoring. Um, if anything, you know what we're seeing from the data from the online polls, in particular, what we have access to internally from Rightmove is a, a slowdown in in new rental listings coming onto the market. Um, particularly across the country outside of London, particularly compared to to other parts of, um, particularly compared to the the levels of of new rental supply we'd seen pre-pandemic. You know, there's potentially a couple of reasons for that I mentioned before. One might be that shift to short-term lettings in in certain cities to holiday accommodation. One of which might be, as as a couple of questions sort of hinted at, those owners looking to, you know, capture those price increases and and sell that property, albeit, you know, we haven't seen from what we can tell so far anyway, if a, a switch of any supply from the rental market into the sales market, which itself has had had um, issues in terms of overall availability in, in the second hand market. It's possibly something that just the, the, the data hasn't been had the chance yet to feed through and we might see some of those trends a little bit further into the future. But not particularly any evidence on it on it at the moment of course you know 
the rents rental growth both in terms of the mainstream market's been strong but obviously also in terms of sort of short-term let-ins holiday accommodation seeing you know a significant price inflection making them particularly attractive investment proposition over the last year in particular okay that's brilliant thank you very much for that andrew um i'm going to move over to imran now uh for the next question um, and someone put a comment in saying the pandemic was obviously very largely unexpected and unprecedented. Um, has any modelling been done on the impact of other wild card or you know major events, um, e.g., another pandemic or some further impacts of climate change uh, that remain to be seen? Thanks, Rory. Yeah, that's it's, you know it's a it's a very good good question. Um, I think I suppose what the pandemic has has shown us is that. Uh, you cannot rely too heavily on on you know or solely on on kind of on forecasts. They are one tool to kind of to provide you with uh, some evidence and information to help you make better decisions. Now that's what kind of forecasts are are about. Um, so kind of our approach of using scenarios is that you know we don't necessarily model specific wildcard events because in some cases they are you know in most cases they're difficult to predict so we have kind of scenarios and then you know i presented three scenarios here but then there are other various scenarios as well that kind of feed off of that and you know if, if i show that on a chart they'll just be they just be lines everywhere but you know we, we we have all these different scenarios and then as we get closer to to kind of you know th through our kind of period and through the timeline we then see okay of these scenarios where are we closer to what does the data, the data suggest and then uh, from those scenarios we then build on that so that's kind of our approach rather than trying to kind of preempt um, any kind of any specific events. You know, obviously, if there are specific, uh, you know, specific announcements or specific policy changes, we will try to capture that and provide the level of information we can. But that's, you know, generally is it's more kind of a, a broad scenario approach that then kind of narrows down further as we observe um, kind of realized data. That's brilliant. Thanks a lot, Imran. Uh, I've got a question here, which is which is actually for the panel um, in in totality. Um, I'm going to go to Francesco first, and then I'll possibly pass over to Andrew uh, to to get his opinion on the question as well. Um, and it states that is there a concern from the panel that developer brackets and funder demand for land uh, will lead to house price inflation, uh, but also future long term land supply issues, which might stifle uh, new build completions going forwards. So I'll go to you, Francesco, first. Yes, thank you. Uh, and I'll pick it up. But I'm sure we all have views on the topic. Uh, and the main thing that we have seen is, uh, yeah, the lack of access to available land for development has definitely stifled growth and stifled housing supply. And we've seen that in the last year when uh, developers that could have really benefited from meeting the very high levels of demand that were there simply were not able. Uh, to do so because there weren't enough outlets out there. Uh, so is there a risk? Yes, there is a risk. And the risk of not enough land coming forward for development is, um, is a real one. Uh, we all know that the limits to that uh, are many and they are complex. We can't simply blame uh, developers. We can't simply blame the planning process. Uh, it is land is a limited supply and it is in high demand, meaning that it gets more expensive and that affects viability. Uh, so the risk is there and we're monitoring it. Homes England is constantly uh, working through its programs and funds to make sure that land comes forward and is unlocked in the right uh, places. Um, so yes, that is one of the main reasons why Homes England is there as an agency, but I'm not sure whether my colleagues would want to add more to this. Might just add, just Francesco, just from the data side, when we've done some analysis on starts in particular, you know, what we've seen this year in particular is an increasing number of those starts come forward on newer sites, so sites that hadn't broken ground um, until this year or until in the last six months, and also on smaller sites in particular. Some anecdotal evidence, admittedly, you know, you can't see this in the data of of some larger developers looking you know to build to take forward sites much significantly smaller sites as well there's what we saw sort of in 2019 2020 was that 
you know, we'd seen an awful lot of starts on sites that were sort of over 200 homes, 200 home plus developments, which sort of dominated that picture. Whereas now we're seeing an increase in proportion of starts on sites between 100 and 200 and particularly under 100 as well. Um, and that's something, you know, we're keeping a, keeping a, um, a strong eye on as well. Like in terms of the age of sites, we did see during 2020 quite a number of, of sort of long standing opportunities be built out or completed, which, you know, as we expected to see during 2020 and you know when we expect to see a boost in in new sites breaking ground during this year because of that of that trend that happened in 2020 but you know that those are some shifts that that we're that we're keeping a, a strong eye on at the moment it's brilliant francesco and andrew thanks thanks for both of your opinions on that one um the next the next comment is, is more of a statement actually rather than a question but it'd be good to get uh, perhaps imran your opinion on this um it's, it's a statement that says house builders are focusing on more expensive properties in the south uh, rather than delivering housing in the north um there's a question mark next to it it'd be good to kind of get your opinions on that one imran yeah i mean i i that was just clarify the uh, kind of the point i made uh, in in the uh in in the presentation was that um it was more about kind of the the change in the in the, in the market kind of you know the, the, there was a certain you know the market market was characterized in one way kind of before the pandemic and that was uh you know then preparing for a post help to buy market where demand was focused on midlands and north of england but then, you know, we've seen in the pandemic that the demand has been, uh, well, the transaction activity has risen fastest for more expensive homes in the south of England. Now, that's of, that's not necessarily a statement on what um, house builders are doing. That's just kind of that's that's just the, the you know the difference we've seen. So they're they're now looking at a different market, and so we've said that as a source of kind of risk because, um, you know, we're not sure how the market will you know will react to that. Um, you know, uh, it remains to be, you know, it remains to be seen, you know, house builders will, you know, they will react to the market, but then there were also kind of, um, you know, sh you know, kind of p policy direction as well that will, that will also try to steer them. So that was kind of the point I was making in, the, you know, in the, in the slide. That's brilliant. Thank you very much for that, Imran. Uh, I think that might actually be all we've got time for in today's session. Uh, I hope it was really useful, uh, that Q&A for, for all the attendees to get that extra bit of insight uh, for the last 10, 15 minutes or so. And that brings me right to the end. Um, if you've got any specific questions for any of our Homes England colleagues, please do reach out uh, to your relationship managers. And if you are unsure who your relationship manager is, uh, please reach out to our Local Government Capacity Centre team. Uh, our email is right in the middle of that final slide and it's cce at homesengland.gov.uk. So from all of us at Homes England, thank you very much and goodbye.